about the chimp? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so today is uh, January 31st, 2021. We're continuing our discussion on the Desiderata extinction nadi. Last week, we were discussing um, how do you free a caged chimp that's been bred in, bred in captivity? And also we spoke a little or a lot about the physics and cosmology and the end times. Um, we also have a new, uh, the silver, um, you know, the Reddit, that's also coming up um, soon. But um, what does everyone want to discuss about today? Or you guys want to continue from last week? I don't know. I leave you to decide. I'm too tired today. Oh. Well, we could relate the current events to our lives as caged chimps. Um, for instance, we're caged, we're in a way blindfolded and we don't know all the workings that are going on, like um, like, like how everything is a house of cards manipulated because we're just so busy with our little chimp concerns. I don't know, that's one aspect. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a good way to tackle it. So, yeah, the right. I think maybe what people don't understand is that uh, the cage chimps is actually a labor camp. So they're basically taking everybody's labor. And then if you say that, then people on the left go, oh, you know, oh, they're farming us. Oh, how ridiculous, you know. <laughs> they're not farming me. Yeah, well, they, they say that because they don't understand the, fi the, the uh, financial instruments and how they work to basically steal your labor that's the 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 monetary system was set up to steal your your labor without you realizing it and so that's that's the aim of it and um, what's being exposed now is people are getting to see behind the curtain and and it's it's, it's very sophisticated and so it's not easy for people to grasp and it's deliberately done that way it's deliberately made to be sophisticated the whole kabuki dance about how money is created was uh a kind of intended to be a ritual that nobody could quite kind of see through and what's remarkable is people like economists are the ones that really understand the least you know they're basically the they um they assume, yeah, economists really don't understand the monetary system. They're just basically ignorant of it. And it's incredible because they advise politicians and, um, you know, they, they kind of have a done in crew. Economists don't generally know that they don't understand how the scam works. And so they're continually coming up with this pie in the sky nonsense about an economy, not realizing that the major thing is, uh, you know, the monetary system and how. It functions to rake the cream off the top just for a few people. Yeah. Does anybody? Uh, I, she, yeah. Okay. I was just going to mention the video that was put up with the vampire squid because that did mention specifically uh, that the um, economists generally didn't understand how money was created. Um, but I was also thinking on the other side of the equation that uh, they also don't understand that uh, the natural resources are excluded from having a, a cost in their calculations. So, so they're kind of excluding the origins of money on one side and excluding the value of the Earth's resources on the other side. When you look at it, they're operating in a very narrow little space uh, I don't know. Do you, do you want to start there? I, 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 you had, I reconnected, so I'm, I'm hopefully on a better thing, but I just I've missed all of that. Oh, <laughs> okay. Else, I'll yeah, I'll, I'll start it again. Uh, uh, the, the vampire squid video you put up, that quite long one, I've not finished it, but in that, the fellow, one of the fellows is talking mentions that the uh, economists don't understand how money is created. Uh, and I was just pointing out that on the other side of it, the economists also don't understand uh, the the value of the Earth's resources because they're they're just a sort of a free thing that they feed their system with without 
pricing it or without putting a value on it. It's just considered their uh, uh, endless thing to to work with. So they're, they're, they're sort of in between the money. They don't don't know quite where that comes from, and the and the the natural resources tend to sort of be something that just is appearing by magic, um, and they're sitting in between. Uh, yeah, the economists are, are basically magicians. They have this this idea that things come into existence and they disappear again. And they basically, so you know, minerals or oil or crops or something, they come mysteriously. They just get prestigiated out of a hat into existence, and then you use them, and then they go off the balance sheet and disappear somewhere, and. They, I mean, that's completely anti-physics. And physics, as we were talking about last time, is it's relentlessly conservative, and you know all quantities are conserved. So you can't create or destroy anything, according to physicists. But it, to economists, everything has been created. GDP is coming into existence out of out of the vacuum. <laughs> it's like, and so. Uh, and then they also assume that uh, technology breaks through limits. And it's they think that, well, you get these occasional limits and, you know, well, you know, Thomas Malthus was an idiot because he said we'd get to a limit and then that would cause a collapse. He said, but we never get to those limits because technology comes and breaks through the limits. And it's like, no, technology does nothing of the sort. Technology just allows you to switch, switch limits. So if you reach the limit on one thing in one way, Technology will let you switch to another limit. It doesn't break through the limit. That's magical thinking. And it's kind of related to this idea that stuff comes from nothing and disappears and goes back to nothing, which is the economist said. So, but nothing in the universe behaves that way. And essentially, all we're doing is rearranging everything on the planet. The economy itself is just rearranging stuff. That's all it is. It's taking stuff out of here. It's taking carbon out of the ground, putting it up in the atmosphere. It's, we're just moving things around. But no economists have a model where they just move things around. And everything, apart from just arbitration and you know settlements and stuff like that. But they have no global and full accounting where everything just shovels around. And if they did, then basically what the economy would look like is a giant oxidation reaction. In essence, the entire economy is just getting carbon out of the ground and steel out of the ground. And then just, and maybe, maybe calcium, making carbonates out of them. You take, you know, the, you make um, uh, out of the lime, you make concrete, and that's, you know, calcium carbonate. And then out of the steel, you make rust, everything, you know, Teslas or whatever, they just turn to rust. And then you, all the carbon gets burned off as, as fuel, and then that uh, basically turns into CO2 in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide. So it's just this giant chemical oxidation reaction from these basic raw materials to uh, these pollutants, oxidized pollutants. So that's all the economy is. And basically it makes a big fire you know, in the chemical reaction, and then that's called um, you know, a healthy economy. So why they want this huge, insane chemical reaction to burn as bright as possible is just delusional. They're just fucking crazy. They should just be put in straitjackets. But the, for some reason, you know, there's got to be a lot of activity and there's got to be a lot of oxidation. <laughs> it's like, why? <laughs> it's uh, so, so yeah, in the, in the interest of keeping this huge incandescent oxidation reaction going, it is essentially a fire. I mean, fire literally is just a carbon oxidation reaction. And so they keep on, you know, the, the fire expands expands and then they relentlessly linear thinkers so they say well look at the graph you know you get these steven pinker types who say look at the graphs do things just go up and up and they're like well yeah i mean a fire has a bigger and bigger perimeter as it burns through the bush but it eventually just at the point where it's brightest and biggest and has the widest perimeter is the time when it runs out of fuel and that's where we are we have peak everything but they don't accept peak everything because they say technology blows through the peaks. So really, what's the technology that makes water out of seawater without using something like oil? Uh, you know, basically, you can't make fresh water out of nothing. We've been mining water. We've been mining minerals. Uh, we're out of them. 
we, we're running out of oil. The whole thing was just really an oil economy. So the idea is just you can go and replace it with wind or solar is a mathematical. So it's it's more than delusional. Yeah. Um, but but th that's where we stand, and all these people are experts. So you know, what do you know? <laughs> like, well, I know the obvious, and I know that you're fucking mad. But yeah, but, but you, we're talking about we're talking about this psychopathic view of of the universe, of the of the world, of the of the earth, of the planet. But I don't know. But for us, the average people who are trying to to see clearly and try to educate ourselves and trying to to see okay we it's very difficult for people who think like we do in a kind of mm, mm, sane way to understand the mind of a of a of a crazy person or crazy uh, economist or crazy psychopath you see and i find that the average the average people find it you know we discussed this thing about money the average people do not want to believe that money is this what we know and they they cling on to the madness that is being propagated through to them since childhood and since generations. So we're facing a whether it's the left or whether it's just people who just don't really have any political affiliations. But we're faced with a I don't know. We're faced like trying to understand something that you, that is completely uh, alien to you. Like for me, it's alien. This what you talk about. This this view of the of of rearranging things and all this. This is alien. But and we have to, you know, you have to understand. You know, is, is it what you mean by getting crazy or not? But, but, you, but as soon as I say it, you know what I'm saying, right? It's you know. kind of like you you get a like. Oh, of course, it's like that. Why did yeah. I say it before, like, you? you know that since you're, you know, well, but. I mean, it just what I'm saying just sounds like sense. As soon as you 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 hear it, surely you have to pinch yourself and go, "Hang on, he's right." Why? What, what yeah. the fuck's wrong with all these Nobel prizes? <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, but that's why this thing I was saying about this video on money that you posted, like even the guy in the video was constantly saying, even though we're explaining how it works and how the Bank of England is functioning, people still believe. In money and putting money in their little saving box, and that putting money in the bank is going to help the pensioners. And it's just, and you're faced with a cognitive dissonance that, that to, of such a scale that you kind of, you know. We, we, we were deliberately brought up. You see, this is why I, I, I get, just get annoyed with people that don't, so that think conspiracies don't exist. Hmm. It's like we were brought up to be workers. And slaves. Basically, if you look at John Taylor Gatto and stuff, he, he'll tell you the history of it. They brought the ideology from Germany where they thought of how do we train the kids so that they will basically go into the factories and go into the armies. And they worked out exactly how the school system should be to make Germany powerful. And that was in like the 19th century. America took it wholesale with all the, the tenants and stuff that they did, um, you know, basically you put kids in desks, you regiment them like soldiers, you tell them this positive attitude, everything must be positive, you know, because otherwise if you criticize the system or analyze it too much, uh, you won't be obedient. So they drill in obedience and the major thing that they're teaching you in school is not knowledge. Everybody, all the women run around going, oh, we must educate the kids. And like, no, the kids are being de-educated in school because what they're trying to do is basically get you on the rhythm of a clock. Because all slaves run by a clock. They have to be, a workforce has to be predictable. If you're random or unpredictable or disconcordant, you're impossible to own as a slave. If, if you don't bring me my fucking tea at 8 o'clock, I mean, I might miss important meetings that are at 10 o'clock. <laughs> so you... Well, basically, it's very hard for me. But I feel like I was brought up in a plantation system, so it's very hard for me to understand why people can't struggle to see this. Because I, I think I mentioned before, this is how my day started, and this was true for about most white people friends that I had and stuff, uh, born in the '60s, and 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 this is how I woke up in the morning, like this, Massa. Here is your tea. And it was 
it was at seven o'clock on the fucking nail. If it was like one minute past seven, or what, my dad would hit the fucking roof. I mean, he was a nice liberal guy and everything, but, but the system had to work on time. Basically, it's seven, you know, but it, it, there's so much involved in, in making a worker go and bring you your tea on seven. Because basically, it's this, this must run on clockwork. It basically it gives you something to attend to. If you get the slave to watch the clock, they are complicit in their slavery because they're waiting for release. They're waiting for the, the dinner gong. So if you have a shit life and, and grind, um, you, it's kind of the suppression and release thing. So basically, you, you put the, them in an oppressive situation. The same happens in school. You put them in this boring, tedium thing. It's, it's not to educate you. It's to train you for tedium. It's to train you to sit at a desk endlessly doing tedious, uh, repetitive tasks and really uh, to not think, to control yourself. They're teaching kids self-control. What they do is the kids start to think of the dinner bell. We used to sit in school going, fuck, if only I can hold on until 12 o'clock, then we get fed. And then the minute the bell goes, well, all the release. Then you get all these endorphins. You get um, you get your hit. So it's exactly the abuse that a pimp does to a hooker. Basically, what a pimp will do. There's this really, really fucking. Oh, it's so fucking deep. This uh, Dave Chappelle uh, talking about why he went to South Africa posted that video. But he talks about this uh, iceberg, iceberg slim. This book in the 1940s about this hooker, and basically. He's telling the audience about the, the capitalist manifesto. And what he says is, he says, uh, you know, that's really cold shit. But he says, if you want a, a pimp, wants a hooker to really uh, be a slave to him, basically, he hits her with a coat hanger. Uh, basically, one pimp was asking another one, how do I get control of this, you know, this hoe who's like being disobedient? And he says, you hit her with a coat hanger. Then... You put her in, um, you, you basically put her in a warm bath and give her pills. And she'll be so fucking grateful she'll forget that it was you that beat her up with a coat hanger. And that's the same with kids in school. If you make it so awful in the morning that they're waiting, just waiting for the dinner bell so they can get released to lunch. When you get to lunch, the food they feed you is crap. It was mainly macaroni cheese and stuff. And uh, even in, I mean, I went to a very expensive school, but they deliberately gave you macaroni cheese and shit like that because they want you to get used to army food. So, so they want to toughen you. And so basically, but you see, if you're sitting in, in, in classes in the morning, um, you're kind of getting beaten up with a coat hanger. In fact, we were literally, now that I mention it, <laughs> we were literally from the, from six, I was beaten up with a coat. Basically you would, you know, it was very, very high tension uh, environment. The the teachers would say, you know, like, come here, come to my desk. And then the whole class would be electric. And you come, she'd get a uh, ruler, uh, 37. And this is a six-year-old, right? This, all of us had this. And then basically, quack, quack, quack mm -hmm. on your leg. <laughs> you, you know, you wore shorts. And, that. and then basically you'd go sitting trembling. And then, but so then when you get to lunchtime, you're so pleased to have lunch and stuff that it all feels okay. You like that hooker. It's basically they, they beat you up and then give you the release as well. And then that's, that's how they keep you in your cage. They don't even have to put doors on the cage <laughs> because, because, uh, but this was done. Um, it was an extension of the system uh, after they enclosed the land. You, most people were not allowed to go outside their parish boundaries for you know, thousands of years in England. You, you needed a signature from the vicar to go outside your parish boundary. The parish boundary was very small. It was like a mile. A lot of the reason why people are inbred in England today is that almost 500 years of basically restriction to the parish boundary. You couldn't go and find the, uh, you know, a mate that wasn't like a relative after a few hundred years. And, but in, you know, what they used to do to kids in England uh, in previous centuries, I would say after the Middle Ages and feudal times, they did what they called beating of the bounds. 
and they would take kids to the parish boundary when you know males really because the females just uh, comply much more easy but they but they would take the males they would take them to the milestones outside the parish boundary and then uh, when you got to each one of the milestones they'd whack each of them six they, you get whacked six with a birch um and that's to reinforce that this is the parish boundary and then you'd go to the next parish boundary and then do whack. And it was called beating of the bounds. Now, the interesting thing is I actually did beating of the bounds in my school. My school was so old fashioned that we did beating of the bounds. The first day when you arrived there, 12 years old, they take you all as a group of boys to each one of the corners of the school property and give you a whack with six <laughs> to, to just reinforce that's the boundary and you're not allowed out. So that's how they kept us incarcerated. Now, it's it's very easy for me to see they made no bones about what they're doing and what the system is for. Well, the trouble with uh, our liberal Western society is they've watered it down. So you guys can't see it <laughs> because it's been made all nice and put sugar cane. It's exactly the system that I went through. It's just been diluted a bit so you just don't see it. And then they put sugar sprinkles on top and tell you it's this and not that. and and then eventually, you know, people are going to PTA meetings in, in America and saying, you know, like, well, you know, I, I want more for my kid and I want, want more schooling and I want more. <laughs> it's like, and they're getting people completely involved in the process of enslaving their kids until they're desperate for it. And that's where, that's where they get to. The slaves demand their change after a while. And, that's, and, and the people have set, they've set up a system where, they're streaming people through school so that when they come out, they're graded in ranks. And that's an important part of making it a functional system. So it's very important. They deliberately, when they set up the schooling system in Britain and, and in America, part of it was to rank and grade kids so that they would give you know, they would humiliate kids. A lot of my schooling was humiliation and of ritual humiliation of the kids by masters. And what they're doing there is they're setting up, they're telling the other kids that this one is undesirable, this one's a good one, and they're ranking them so that the kids enforce that. They'll run out after school and they'll go, oh, little Johnny, oh, you're so thick. <laughs> and that's that they were given that cue by the teacher. That's what they wanted, uh, basically. And the reason is then you have a nice pyramid, and that pyramid is very functional because it's it slots in. The, the virtue of a hierarchy is is that um, it's embedded. You can once you have a triangle, triangles embed in triangles. So if I give you any unit of people, like ten people, point one of them a leader. That's a, a hierarchy. Now, the great thing is you can say 10 of those leaders. So then you've got 100 people. You can take 10 of those leaders, and you can put them in a little hierarchy. And you can do that infinitely. You can stack. And so the point of a hierarchy is it's infinitely stackable. So a lot of the part of the thing where they invented, for the Industrial Revolution, they invented the nuclear family. And what was supposed to be was dad was the proxy for the king and the government. And he would just rule the house like a mini kingdom. And then basically he would be part of a parish and the parish would be ruled also a little hierarchy. And then somebody out of the parish would basically be part of the manor. A few parishes would be a part of the manor. And then the same, the manor would basically have somebody that would go to the house of lords and represent. But you see, it's nicely stackable. And then basically at the apex, you have the queen. And then or the king. And then basically that that's a stable structure. And a lot of people said, this is fucking great because we have a stable structure. It makes England invincible. And now we can go and beat up all these other people that don't go in for this <laughs> Spartan crap. And so, um, but it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because everybody around you, if you go in for this game, then everybody around you has to do it or die. So it, it went back all the way to ancient Greece where they started the Spartans started the system the, my school system owed everything its conception it's um, it was it was an adoration of the Spartan system so basically we, we had this tacit um, appreciation of the Spartan system it was kind of an ideal and that's pretty much what fascism is it's an appreciation of the Spartan ideal and so 
basically they did this in Sparta. And what it meant was, well, you could cut down all the forests that you had on your little Greek island, make triremes, and go and beat up the guys next to you. If you did that, then basically you've got two islands. And you've got a whole lot more, more woods. You can chop down those woods, make even more triremes, and you just carry on until you meet somebody else who's doing the same game, and then you duke it out. And that's what happened in ancient Greece. So now all of ancient Greece, and all of Greece today has, most islands are barren. They all used to have forests. They were all cut down, um, you know, 3,000 years ago to make triremes. And the thing was, you didn't get to opt out. You didn't get to opt out because if the guys neighboring you were Spartans, if you didn't cut down your forest to protect yourself, then basically they would overrun you and you'd become a slave. And you didn't want to be a Hippolyte slave because they, the, they ran the Hippolyte slaves just like uh, we did at school. They had guards and then if they didn't work hard enough, uh, uh, a guard would just come and hack you down just, just at random. While you're working in the fields, you'd go like, uh, what's the time? 12 o'clock. Oh, haven't cut one of these guys down today. You're just going, whop. <laughs> and basically, it's all just to keep everybody enslaved. Um, so it was a brutal thing. But So if you didn't want to be a slave, you had to basically play the game and, and ruin your ecology so you could fight. And then that, we're playing that game out all the way for thousands of years. Now we're getting to the end game. The end game is that that game. You chop up your resources and then go and use use it to basically try and expand and colonize your neighbors. And and now we, the, the final the final nail in this coffin is China. China's doing this on a very large scale. They are mm -hmm. the last ones to do this is the final empire. But they're not going to get anywhere because basically before they they've got a 20 you know five generation outlook. I'm telling you they're all dead in the next two so they're fucked. <laughs> they just haven't got the Hugh, first. can I? Yeah. Can I come in there, do you mind? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, that was all I was saying, yeah. I Just just looking at two things that, uh, because we're no longer in, in a position where, you know, you're hopping from Greek island to Greek, Greek island, sort of destroying everything as you go, that there's... There's just uh, we've we've filled up the planet and we've just about uh, reached the limit of what can be had from anywhere. So um, the the first part of what I'm saying is that the sort of the cage that we're supposedly getting out of, uh, and then when you get out of it, I mean I know I know there's different different aspects to getting out of the cage, uh, psychological as well. But um, you know we're getting out of the the cage uh, to find that what's outside there's nothing there. there there isn't anything the other thing is that this is happening at the same time that the virus is waking people up to the fact that they are in a cage for the first time because they're imposing much stricter limits they're, they're, it, I was reminded of it just, just a minute ago about the parishes the parish boundary and we're getting back to that with the virus, where you can't go out or you can only go so far and you've got to satisfy certain requirements and you need permission and all this kind of thing. So at the same time as we're, we're, as we're sort of accidentally being aware, uh, made aware of the, the existence of the cage, um, then when you look out through the bars, it's increasingly looking as though, well, if you ever did get out of the cage, so what? There's nothing to be had. Um, uh, so I don't know. I mean, does that spark anything in you? I just what it's worth. So, so I've been saying from the beginning, right? The first episode that I did in the video series that I did was was Escape by Getting Rich, and that's basically what everybody's plan is. What they the plan they encourage you to do at school is that you you go with the system, you play with this, uh, you you play ball. You stick with the rules and you try and compete with your fellows to get rich. It's it just keeps you competing in a zero sum game and it keeps everybody down. That's basically the way you know when 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 we compete, the elites win. And so they set up a competitive environment and a one upmanship environment with endless amounts of status symbols and badging and ranking and stuff like that. So that's how they they win. 
Now, the, the second video was the obvious thing when everybody, anybody that figures out this game, they goes, well, this is fucking rigged. So it took, it took me a long time to, I thought like everybody else that I could basically make it in this. I'd be the one exception that would break the casino. And it was like, yeah, it took me a long time to realize that's completely rigged. But I, I learned it was completely rigged because I gave it my best shot and I saw right in the inside of this piece. The upshot of it was, as I couldn't explain it to anybody else because they just flat out didn't believe me because I was, I, I was telling, you know, nobody wants to hear. They've invested so much. Um, in, it's sunk cost, right? It's kind of like going to Hollywood and having your dream and you want to become an actress or something like that. And then you invest so much in that dream when somebody says, no, nah, it's all nepotism. You can't make it in Hollywood. It's got nothing to do with talent or looks. It's got, so it's basically who do you, who's your dad, man? It's nepotism. And so, you know, people don't want to hear that. But then eventually, when they're too old to make it in Hollywood, they eventually learn the truth. And then they tell, start telling, warning other people. But it doesn't work because, you know, you're never going to tell a young Turk who's going to beat the casino and tell him, hey, this is all rigged. Oh, it's rigged. That's a loser. You're a loser. You're an old loser. That's why you blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no. <laughs> anyway, it's always like that. You're an old has-been, so the young are never going to listen to you. So you can't tell them the game. They, don't, they won't listen. Uh, so, But the second one is when you eventually get it, everybody eventually gets it. And that's the end of the first video, hopefully. <laughs> uh, then the second video was then everybody wants to drop out. They say, well, that's it. It was fucking rigged game. We're heading for the hills. What I'm saying in the second two parts is that you can't head out. There is no out anymore. The, basically, the prison escape it covers the whole earth. I, you remember we talked about Gauguin, and uh, very, very sad about Gauguin because Gauguin was exactly that. He was a stockbroker. <laughs> Gauguin was Wall Street Bates. He got to see the inside of the beat, and he became a reformed stockbroker. He said, this is fucked, and became an artist. And But he was he, what he was going against was the alien cortex. The alien cortex is what um, in, enslaves us. And so he made a grand heroic effort to escape the alien cortex. And he went all the way to Tahiti, which is like the farthest place you can go in the world. And it's really the last outpost where everybody's naked and close to paradise. And it really is. If you've been to Tahiti, I had my honeymoon in Tahiti. And it, Gauguin wasn't kidding. The light there, everything which everybody looks at in a museum now in, in New York or something, they look, you look at a Gauguin now and it looks like a fantasy. They go, oh, this guy was just on acid or something. No, he really, the light is like that in Tahiti. It's just a really virgin paradise. So he got to paradise and then he found that all the women had already, they were already put in these kind of almost burka like things. Um, Basically, the missionaries had got to, got to him 50 years before he got to Tahiti, and they'd basically already filled their heads full of Christian crap and guilt and um, had body guilt so that they all covered up. And their whole society was ruined by the time he got there. So he, he lived and died in Tahiti, but, but it's tragic because he he's discovered that, that Paris, which he was trying to escape, which represented the alien cortex film, had got all around the world. And so we're talking like 1850. So by 1850, the alien cortex had conquered the whole world so thoroughly that he could go to Tahiti and just despair and said, like, there's nothing left. So you can't... Yeah, I remember. Um, you know, basically, millennials go, finally, oh, you know, you know, or, or, or you know, Gen F or something. They, they come and they go, well, I, I finally got it. The system's not for me. I'm heading for the hills and say, what hills? Basically, where you intend to go to, basically refugees are coming to your city. It's the other way around. The influx is, is basically you going against the stream, you horrid little liberal overprivileged shithead. That you, the, the oceans of people coming towards you out of this fucking desert that you created with your consumption. And they, they, but they fondly imagine. I mean, I've talked to people who like ask me things and DM and stuff, and they say, "Well, uh, how are we going to survive this? You, you know, what are we going to? I, I think I'm going to like head north and hook up with some nomads." And it's like, "What fucking planet are you on? If you really think they're the fucking nomads out in the tundra that you're going to hook up with <laughs> after collapse? It's like, what 
you, it's just unbelievable that these people believe this. You know, this is the common or garden fantasy that these people honestly believe that you can go and get a little vegetable patch and you can go. I said, like, where are you going to get the fucking water? They just started a water futures market, a water futures market. Okay. Now, if you don't understand trading, basically, once you've made a futures market out of it, basically, it is corralled. Basically, from there on out, the price is only going to go one way. So you can't go and be a friend of the earth and do your fucking hydroponic gardening and do permaculture and stuff. You say the first thing you're going to do if you want to do that is learn about the futures trading because you're going to have to trade futures to get your fucking water, asshole. So basically, these people are so fucking clueless of where we're at. We are water is a mind commodity. We've taken water from the Ogallala. Um, aquifer and America and mined it. And we've mined it since the 1950s. It's that close to running out. We're on the dregs. They have to do these boreholes and now some places a kilometer deep. That's a, it's a million bucks at minimum a kilometer. So it's like you're going to need a million bucks to get down to the water table that they are drilling down a million a kilometer further every year. So you have so for your little potato patch and your little hippie commune, you're going to need a million bucks just to keep on drilling the water table down where they, you know, the almond dealers and all these guys basically growing cash crops, they mining that water at one kilometer every fucking year. So to keep up with them, you'll need a, a million dollars set aside just to run your borehole deeper. So so this is complete fucking fantasy where they, all these kids are living it. And so I'm saying, so then I'm sorry I'm getting so upset about this, but it's really fucking upsetting me that nobody can hear this shit. But there's no escape to anything. There's virtually nothing left. The seas are 90%, 90% of the fish are gone. And I know people that are thinking, well, I'm going to go fishing. I'm going to go to fucking Bangkok or something. And like, I'm going to go to Thailand, sit on the beach when this all goes to crap, and I'm going to fish. Really? <laughs> You fucking take fish in Greece here, the fucking guys will put an axe in your head. You know, you, you know how it's contested? All these things. Ask Sophie about, oh, we're going to live off seaweed from the locks. Yeah, with a fucking permit, you'll stand in line behind all the guys who get seaweed off the rocks. You know, the mussels in the bay around, around the corner over here, basically, you can get mussels off the rocks. But you fucking have to compete <laughs> with the dagger to all these starving kids that are trying to do the same. So you can't escape. Basically, there's nothing to escape to. We've, we, we're at the point where we have to su sabotage the current economy just so that there's going to be something left in Africa and South America and all these guys who really are left of indigenous populations. Just to give them one last Hail Mary pass, we're going to have to sabotage the, the global system soon. And so the yeah, thought well, this of is, this them is, is ludicrous. But you got to so so you have to come to a mature realization of where we're at. Is that we're in Auschwitz? There's nothing outside Auschwitz. Basically, the next place outside of Auschwitz is Mars, and it's basically there's so much radiation there. You might as well go and live in a nuclear reactor. And uh, basically, there's no water, <laughs> and nothing grows on it. Well, that's the next place. That's the place Elon Musk wants to escape to. It's like, good luck, asshole. But, but so you got to come to the conclusion. We, we're cage chimps. We're in a plantation. We're in a labor camp. This is Auschwitz. Let's not make any bones about it. This is Auschwitz. The mass killings are coming soon. And basically, the, so you say, well, what do you do about it? Well, the first thing is stop pretending you're not in Auschwitz. And then work from there. You have to say, I am a slave. Wake up in the morning and say, I am a slave. <laughs> what do I do about it? And then you go to, well, then the whole vista opens up. But it's not a vista where you can defect or you make a parallel polis. You know, some guy on Reddit here, in the middle of this thing where we finally got our chance to bring the system down, basically the, the you know, derivatives time bomb is just fucking ticking. Basically, what these guys on Wall Street Bedstone realize is that Silver could take down the derivatives time bomb, 1.5 quadrillion meltdown. That would be the end, the end. And it might happen. It, oh, please, God, let it happen. It, it, if it doesn't happen this week, 
it's, here, what, what, what's happened is that they can't unsee what, what these guys have done. So it's very important in, in terms of education. But anyway, the point is that if you, if you are cognizant of, of, of where we're at, you can get meaning to life and a whole different vista opens up in terms of uh, resistance and what you can do. But you're in Auschwitz and you've got to fight and you've got to fight from the inside and you've got to fight like buggery. So, so yeah, I, I, I got distracted. I was, trying, the, I was saying that this guy was saying, now in the middle of this, he's saying like, oh man, you've got to make this happen, guys. And in the middle say, well, we, you know, this is only half the story. Uh, you know, was the, the thing where I suggested to exile that you basically should do do this exactly what they're doing on Wall Street bets that I, I told them about a year ago, and then then this guy saying, you know, obviously a tanky, you know, communist, and he's saying, well, this is only half the story. This is really good because it brings down the capitalist system. But what we should be doing is taking all that money and building co-ops and stuff. <laughs> it's like, oh, you just haven't got a clue where we're at. It's like. You know, we're five years away from the fucking methane bomb going off. You just got to let communism go. The clock ran out on it. Would have been. It was a nice idea. It's all very alien cortex and ivory tower, and basically, it's. But you know, I think that China is trying to go for a communist utopia, but they're going to be caught short very shortly because they they can't get to here from there. They're trying to. I think what China's trying to do is they haven't abandoned communism. Uh, the West is all full of their own narrative. So they say, oh, they abandoned communism and done state capitalism. I don't really believe it. I think that uh, China's trying to take over the whole world and do, you know, using capitalism so they can get to communism is what I think they're trying to do. But they're not going to get there. And so all these tankies and stuff can forget it. The clocks run out. Hmm. Clock ran out in the 1960s. So it's basically we're never going to get to socialism. We're never going to get to communism. We basically you you just got you're in Auschwitz. You don't you don't say well we can't burn down Auschwitz until we know what replaces it. You're in Auschwitz. Who gives a fuck what replaces it? If it's bare earth, it's better than what you're in now. <laughs> well, um, we're speechless. Uh, <laughs> Not really. <laughs> but it's really well, well, bears, well, am I wrong? Am I am I wrong? I mean, well, it's really bears, it really bears some um, uh I don't know what that phrase is, but yeah, this the title of your later videos were No Escape. Uh No Escape. And um yeah, it's it's like once you've said it that we're just rearranging molecules, we're just, you know, getting iron out of the ground and making it oxidize, we're making fossil fuels into plastic. Um, once you've said that, and I've heard it, it's true. You can't, you can't erase it from your mind. But I think the problem is a lot of people, like scientists, they're so specialized. They only see uh, the principles of their art or their science, and they don't really see the big picture. And it's more like they've been brainwashed or maybe years of schooling. Uh, accepting all the principles of their field and they can't connect the bigger picture of you know all these dots that are that uh that would lead to the conclusion that yeah it's it's desperation time yeah you see that was also a function of schooling you see they didn't only segment you horizontally they also segmented you vertically so they did streaming to try and put you in a narrow field so they're no generalists anymore so the, the basically uh and that's the problem is our alien cortex thinks in a little narrow frame so every, everybody thinks well maybe my little frame is screwed up but i'm pretty sure in the bigger picture <laughs> it's everybody else's frame is is better and and they they don't put it together that basically now that we all it doesn't it doesn't work by parts it's basically it's a kantian hole in the the whole contributes to the parts and the parts contribute to the whole. So you can't just say, well, this bit works and that bit works. and that So that's okay. It's like, no, do you think you're 50% uh, okay if like 50% of your bodily organs work? No, <laughs> I think you're pretty fucked if half your organs don't work. But you see economists again, they see it in all frames. So like, well, there's a problem here. You know, look at the bright side. This part is good, and this part is good. And you say, like, it doesn't admit to parts. 
And that's why I said in one of the videos, those Procrustean frames are going to get us. Because nobody can see. There are a couple of things that people are not good at. Alien cortex are not good at. It's very linear. And so it just extrapolates the graph forward. So people look at China and they go, well, well, uh, China's going to be, oh, China's going to take over the world. Look at the, look at the graph. You, look, you can just uh, extend it like this and uh, see the future. And so like, no. That's almost no systems work linearly like that. There are very few systems in nature that are, could be described as linear. And so basically, what, the rule in nature is regression to the mean. So if you see a graph like this, as the graph goes up, the chances that it has a, full, a hard correction downwards are increasing exponentially. But nobody does that. They just extrapolate to infinity. So, that, so part of that is because they don't understand feedback. And so they don't understand feedback mechanisms. And they don't understand that all these things are linked. They all think that they all submit to parts. So that, so that, and that also is done deliberately. Uh, and it's done for control. So part of the system, that specialization was a consequence of um, control. And what it came from was, was Taylorism. You see, in the good old days, people had skills and they had guilds. So if, you know, workers used to, if you were a plumber or shipwright or a carpenter or, um, you know, any, any one of these guys are mason. You had real skills. It took you a fucking lifetime, and they had a system of apprenticeship. During the Middle Ages, they had a guild system and apprenticeship. And at 12 years old, you would, you know, if you were really lucky, you'd be invited into the guild, and you'd be trained up as an apprentice and go through this long thing until you became a master, which is still, by the way, preserved in our credentials, uh, you know, we still call somebody a master if you go through university long enough. But the, um, the, that idea was very dangerous for capitalists who basically just pay rent. They're just living off rent, so they rentiers. So why that's dangerous is because they got any uh, person with skill, like an engineer, um, could just tell you, no, um, I'm not playing ball anymore. Uh, then, you know, capital and labor were even because the skills involved in uh, these these crafts were complete. So it's kind of like a, a cook. It's like if you have a chef today, a chef is still like that because a chef makes the whole meal. And you can't, you, you know, if, if you're the owner of the restaurant, you're on an even footing with the chef because he can say, I'm not cooking. And you can't say, ah, oh, well, I'll put it together myself. And what they did was uh, when they realized that there was too much control in labor because of, um, you know, so a competitor would do all the jobs. What they did was they broke them down. And part of them was Ford and these guys, and particularly this guy called Taylor, was he, he analyzed. He got the guys and he said, okay, what do you do in your job on a factory floor? And he broke it down into minute parts. And the, the point was that then they could steal those parts. You could get a monkey to do each one of the steps. So he, in effect, stole their knowledge and broke it down so that now you have a Ford-like production line. And each person just does one specialized task that's very unskilled. So you took a skilled labor set and broke it down into unskilled labor sets. And then that broke labor. Because then basically you can always get an unskilled person and it's a kind of divide and conquer thing. And that's happened all the way through and it even happens in academia and even white collar workers and all the way even to academics and scientists and Nobel Prize laureates. And so, but, but because they're fragmented, now we're in real trouble because there are very few people that have a holistic view other than these people at the very top, the one percenters and these guys, you know, behind the scenes, the deep state and all these people that you now will find out exist to your cost. <laughs> but those, those guys have a complete view. And, and you, so, know, you know that the guild community yeah. still exists. The guilds still exist in Sweden, Norway, Germany, France, and some parts of northern Italy. And you still have got people working like in the Middle Ages with apprentices that start very young. And then when they, when they, I met, I met some German ones who were traveling a few years back, and they still dressed in the old traditional clothing of the of their. The ones I met were carpenters. And they meant they made to travel for a year and a day without me seeing their family, having to go from country to country to town to town by their own means with with a very minimum amount of money 
and they have to survive by their skills. So the ones that arrived here, they had been hitchhiking and they were sleeping wherever they could. And they arrived in the boatyard and they said they were carpenter. Could they sleep on the boat? And they did a bit of work. And then they came to my house and they did some of the shelves you see behind. And and there's some guys doing it in France in in silvercraft, in all sorts of things, metal, uh, uh, you, you name it. They've got nearly all the guilds still exist. It's just that people don't know because they're tiny little little groups, but they, they still exist on a, underground. So, so I'll propose something to you here. If, if the a, a global economy, if we kicked its nuts in, and it's important that activists did it. So like it, why it's very important on what it's going to collapse anyway, but it's very important that it's done deliberately. And the reason is that basically you could always stop it getting up again. You see, if you, if you let it crash automatically, they'll do a great reset and they'll just recreate the whole monstrosity all over again. We're off to the races. But if activists bring it down, then they can bring it down again and again. They can stop it getting up. Once, once the giant is knocked over, they can stop it getting back on its feet. And that's very important. But, but think of this. If the global economy crashed, you would get back to those guilds. People wouldn't notice it. They wouldn't think of it in a positive way. But if you go and look at, say, like uh, in Puerto Rico and stuff after the hurricane, it's exactly what mutual support is. A, a guy could do electricity. A guy could do plumbing. A guy could do carpentry. A lot of guys who had a narrow range expanded it because there was no one else to freaking do the job. But if you, you know, the... If you were a mechanic or something after the hurricane, then you went through all these places that had no government help, and you started to help. You started to wire up electric. You started to help people with farming and stuff. And there were little guilds that start training people to so that other people can go and do it. And you got that system. But you're only going to get there if you stop all this tanky crap and all this communist bullshit and socialist crap and all this alien cortex nonsense. You've got to burn the system down to the ground and then say, rely on this thing that everybody says, human ingenuity will save us. Well, fucking put your money where your mouth is. Burn the system to the ground and then show me what human ingenuity can do. But don't, you know, run this system and say, oh, we can't touch it until human ingenuity has figured out this or human ingenuity will take Auschwitz and make it into Eden. It's like, it's not going to happen. Burn the system down to the fucking roots and then there are human ingenuity. And what will happen is human ingenuity is exactly like that. They'll do guilds. All of this stuff will emerge naturally from the green shoots. But you can't do it in while this is in place. This, there's this thing in XR, too, where they feel like, why can't we start the new system? We, got, we can't only destroy this system. We have to create the new system, too, not in parallel. How are you going to create the new system in parallel? They'll come and break your knees. <laughs> They'll tax you on the new system to pay for the old system. It's, it's just burn it down, guys. Burn it down to the ground. Stop this shit. There's no time left. But to return to the silver thing you were talking about at the start, and I think we're soon going to be cut by the recording, so I think it's soon going to finish. But I, I wanted to know uh, how, how we can, as activists of uh, whatever level we are, encourage um, people to look into this um, activity on the markets and where we can have an input and how we can help. Do you know, because And I'd like to understand more about the silver. Go, go and get a trading account, but you, you have to be real quick. No, I, I, I'm not. I, I don't have any money, so I would never be involved in that. But I'd like to understand how how you can, I don't know, what, what's... No, the thing is to just, could just, just go and buy 25 shares. <laughs> it's to just, just go and go around, the, go around on the street and or, or <laughs> you know, with, with a sign saying, I will set you up on... Well, you don't want to do Robin Hood anymore because... Um, Robin Hood is basically the, the those guys are tainted. <laughs> I don't see that company surviving. What they did there was fucking illegal, fucking illegal. It was unconscionable. Basically, the system is so rigged. If if nobody knows what happened, it was basically somebody must have put in a phone call because they were all using this Robin Hood free trading app, and some somebody must have put a phone call from the Treasury or SEC and something. But they 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 halted trading. Uh, so you were only allowed to sell. They halted buying 
on, on, on stocks. So that's blatantly illegal. It's blatant stock manipulation. And they, they immediately got shot with lawsuits. But, but the only way they would have done that is if some little prick from the White House or something got on the phone. So the, the, the fact is that basically there's censorship, there's all this shenanigans going on, but now everybody sees it. If, if you had said, oh, you know, if all the ants got, got together and went for the elephants, um, you know, the deep state would intervene or, or it's rigged as, oh, all the left would say, oh, ridiculous. Said, okay, tell me how Robin Hood stopped trading on it or stopped selling. They basically broke the fucking law. People have gone to jail for 10 years for what they did. Guess what? They're going to get out of it. So tell me why they did it. They didn't because somebody got on the phone. It's rigged. The whole fucking thing is rigged. And they, 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 they haven't fooled a single one of these, these uh, basically Gen F crowd or these millennials. They, were, they knew exactly what happened. So anyway, uh, get a trading platform and, and tell people, hey, get on this. Chuck. Just buy 25 shares in SLP. <laughs> but, but, but the caveat is you have to be prepared to lose it. You have to be prepared to lose. Whatever you yeah. whatever you yeah. put is a donation to the planet. You, but, yeah. but you have to go around telling people, say, like, how much do you spend? Going, Think of the people that went in XR to London. There are a lot of people, like, well, it was a million at one stage. How many people have they spent bus fare? What did they do? They spent... How much did they spend in travel? 20 bucks? And then they got Starbucks when they got there. The, um, exhausted a million on fucking vegan meals. So, so we, we're already up to 25 million. <laughs> Just on fucking turning up before we even put on all the fucking clothes. We wasted all the time at work. We were, did all the painting. All the hours and hours that went into that. Just stop that bullshit. Take the fucking money that you wasted all your time getting arrested. Oh, what all those cunts have got arrested? They're going to pay six grand fines. You stupid tits. Take that six grand and put it on the fucking stock market. What are you, stupid? <laughs> if you've got six grand to burn, why give it to the fucking judge? <laughs> Jesus, are you stupid? Well, I think you it's because... And say, say, get on a trading app, take whatever money you can afford to burn and give it to the planet. <laughs> I think it's because, as you mentioned once, it seems like a lot of uh, people in XR and just in general in society are financially naive because there were high barriers before to even investing. Like, you know, you had to pay high fees to um, to invest no, in stock. No, no. no but, it's just ignorance. It's just inertia. There was never. You see, see, these guys on Wall Street bets, they were they. They are on the right, you know. They they like 4chan. Basically, Wall Street's bets is 4chan. It's it's. I no. These guys really get upset when I when I say quantanon. You know what a quant is? Is uh, yeah. Quantitative analysis, basically a, a trader, right? The scummier ones, you know, the ones that use algorithmic trading to rip rip off little old ladies and and pension funds. They're basically all those quants. They they um. The yeah, so so it is an extension of it's kind of like um, 4chan and QAnon went to Wall Street. <laughs> so people don't like me saying quantum number. That is what it is. But you see, the left didn't do all this shit. They've been have they have their heads up their ass with you know all this identity politics. And so meanwhile, the the right and particularly young boys were fermenting this real rebellious spirit against the system. And that's what the left should have been doing. It should have been spending all these decades doing that instead of doing greed new deals and all this stuff. It, they should have been fermenting this culture of resistance, which 4chan was doing. And if you have a look at those guys, they're exactly what, what I'm trying to do on ExoMed. They kind of they have a thing of resistance, very low ego. <laughs> they're facing the sense of fun. Yes. All these things that you need, and they, what they're doing is pure discordianism. They they're doing really, a they, it's so annoying because this was invented on the left. This was invented um, by Robert Anton Wilson. He was one of the first discordians, <laughs> and this came from the left. And the left went to sleep, and now it's been picked up by the right. And now people on the left, they won't have anything to deal with it. If you say, oh, fascist, eco-fascist, anything. You know. And now it's got to the ridiculous stage where the left, which should be the Luddites and people ready to tear the economy down, they're the ones trying to prop it up. Well, we need a Green New Deal. We need to vote for Biden and stimulus and social justice. And these are like, what the fuck? How did you get 
completely across the aisle in, in two generations. You guys should be burning this shit down. Now all the conservatives, they doing what the left should have been doing for they they've been brewing this and now it's coming to the fore and stuff. So the left needs to catch up and needs to get involved. And so so because these guys were insiders then they knew that you you had apps, you had, you know, low trading was uh, very cheap and stuff, but yeah, you're going to get like close to to zero trading, but yeah, I mean the 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 guys know. Yeah, they 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 savvy enough to um, add instability to the market. So you so what what all this trading is doing is adding uh, instability. So so it, they're not adding risk, right? I said on one of my videos, right? The markets like risk. A lot of why these these hedge funds are hedging against risk. The derivatives market is a big hedge against risk. So they love risk. What they don't like is uncertainty.